Hi everyone, it's Eve Bentley Blowitz from SpiritGirl.com and welcome to the Spirit Girl Talk Show podcast. I'm super excited to be here with you today and with our very special guest, Dr. Uma Naidu, who is a Harvard-trained psychiatrist. She is actually a food mood expert, professional chef, and more importantly, she is the author of the Food Mood Connection, which is a her book, which is officially launched in Australia. And I'm super excited to have you here today, Dr. Uma Naidu, with our Spirit Girl Global audience. Welcome. Thank you so much, Yvette. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. Well, you know, I'm an absolute fan of your work and of your book, yeah. which officially has two book titles, which I'll get yes. you to share yes. a little bit about. Yes. This, um, this is one of the titles that you have, uh, same book, this released in the UK, India, um, Australia, and South Africa. And the base same book is the hardcover uh, US version, which is This Is Your Brain on Food. And um, so it's the same book. Uh, it's just different, slightly different versions in different parts of the world. And it's also been translated in about, uh, into about 15 different languages, but those will be rolling out throughout the course of this year. Wonderful. Well, congratulations on your book. And Thank I want to now dive in before we go into the book. Are you happy to tell our audience a little bit about yourself? I'm happy to, absolutely. Um, I was born and raised uh, in South Africa to Indian parents. Uh, several generations of family who grew up there. And um, I grew up in a family surrounded by lots of food and love and joy around eating, but also um, many, many doctors in the family. Um, so I had uncles and aunts who were physicians, allopathic medical doctors, and a couple of Ayurvedic doctors in the family as well. So I skipped out of preschool and spent uh, the time with my grandma, who the book is dedicated to, my maternal grandmother, and as well as my parents. But uh, I, would, I would hang out Yvette, with her during the day because it was much more fun than preschool. And, you know, I would pick fresh vegetables in the garden with her and help her prepare meals and generally just have a good time. So I really, um, you know, cherished that phase of my life. And I was with her during the day because my mom's a double boarded physician and she was at medical school setting. Um, but I, that, that sort of imprint around food and nutrition, uh, as well as the medical influence, really stuck with me because, um, you know, I, I also was taught meditation and yoga my, by my grandparents. So kind of came with those things into the world. And when I began to study mental health, was when I started to really utilize these different aspects of my cultural background because I felt that there needed to be more tools in the toolkit for someone. So uh, that's a little bit about my background. And, and then I moved to study in the US and, and that's what brought me to, to Harvard. Wow, what an incredible story. Your grandmother sounds so amazing. Oh, that sounds like <laughs> the best preschool ever. <laughs> exactly, it was much more fun. That's much more yeah, fun. that's amazing. And then obviously what triggered, what was the moment when you thought like I'm just gonna dive into this food you obviously just had a curiosity with the food I did mm -hmm. and then you did, did you start researching because the whole food mood has really just become more um, of a topic recently or yes. over the many years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how did the, the that journey start of course. So uh, you're absolutely right. The, the research around the gut microbiome and that connection in mental well-being really has burgeoned over the last two decades with, you know, I would say if you went to medical school a few decades ago, we weren't, um, you know, uh, it's not really something that was being taught. Um, but that is because we really understand so much more now. And really between I would say uh, 2013 and maybe 2017, there were about 12,000 publications in the area, if not more. So I think that, you know, it just speaks to the fact that it, it, it's such, a, it's such a, uh, a big area of research now. 
But, you know, I think going back to um, what really changed things for me, I would say that uh, one of the things was, was a, a early on in my career patient who I had started prescribing medications and the individual, uh, you know, came in and was uh, feeling that, um, you know, perhaps I uh, had I'd been the I had been the the reason that he had gained weight, and I was definitely taken off guard. I was new in in training, and um, I uh, was probably more timid. And he was kind of yelling at me. But he also had a very large cup of coffee. You know, in Boston, it's a twenty ounce cup of coffee, which is pretty large, and it's from our favorite coffee store called Dunkin' Donuts, if you've ever visited the New England area. And I thought, well, I know that I haven't caused his weight gain and because I know that because I could see his medical chart in front of me on the computer. And I said to him, but, you know, let's call him Bill. I said, Bill, what did you, what did you put in your coffee? And he said, he stopped and he looked at it and he said, oh, I put whatever I usually put, you know, which is this, I put cream in the, the, but when we broke it down, we sat down at my computer and I actually broke down the nutrition for him. He was putting more than a quarter, close to a quarter or half a cup of processed creamer. Um, and then he was adding eight teaspoons of sugar every day to his coffee. So when he understood the calories and the, you know, the not so great in nutrients that, uh, or I should didn't say nutrients, but the not, not so great ingredients in things like processed creamer, um, he was shocked. And he realized that something that was just a daily habit was bringing into his body so many calories that he on his own wanted to make some healthier changes. He loved coffee and there's no harm in that, but what he was adding to the coffee was making it unhealthy for him. And when I saw his, it's almost like the penny dropped for him that he made this, when I showed it to him, he made the association and he thought, well, I can make a healthy habit change. I can do this differently. This actually is likely contributing to weight gain. I saw how powerful it was to translate information for individuals. And that just really led me down the path of, of studying more and researching more and eventually, you know, studying nutrition, but also the culinary arts, because I felt like those were very powerful components um, of what I was doing. Wow, that's an incredible story. And just, I can, you just took us all there on that journey where, really where that penny dropped and you started looking yeah. at his day-to-day -day lifestyle and breaking yeah. it down. Um, and I'm so glad that he brought that coffee in as much as he got really <laughs> upset, but had he right, not... Right. We wouldn't be here today. It, so gratitude. You know, it really made a difference. It, it, yeah. it you know, I, 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 as you can see from my background, I always love nutrition and food and all of that. But yeah. that really put it together in a powerful way that if someone understood what they were taking into their body and the difference that it could make. And then I really started to explore that area and began incorporating it into my everyday practice in mental health. Um, so when I had the opportunity with all the research in the microbiome that has been going on uh, to start my own clinic at Mass General, which is the only such clinic in the United States uh, based in nutritional psychiatry, I, I took it and I, you know, have been very happy trying to share that work. Wow. And sharing your work, I'm going to ask the next question. We're hearing about this all the time. Uh, that our gut is our second brain. And yes. why is that? Absolutely. So the gut and brain actually, um, although they're far apart in the body, they arise from the exact same cells in the embryo, which then grow, develop, and then move apart in the body. And then they are connected throughout life by the 10th cranial nerve called vagus nerve, which allows for a uh, really bi-directional flow of chemical messages between these two organs, really allowing them to have a conversation. And one of the conversations they have is around the big breakdown products of our food, um, which then can, uh, you know, then begins to create these chemical messages. But also the vagus nerve is called the wandering nerve and it's part of the enteric nervous system, which surrounds the, the gut. 
and it's a very extensive system. And the um, the gut is called the second brain because it has and is surrounded by and is in communication with the enteric nervous system. So it really is thought of in that way. And uh, people therefore, you know, also know that there's communication through the vagus nerve between the gut and the brain. So it really is thought of that the uh, some people like to call the the gut the second brain because it's kind of in a different part of our body, but you know, kind of conducting its own uh, its own messaging, let's say, because of those communications. So does that mean we have a series of neurotransmitters, or it's the signaling? Is it through the gut, through the vagus nerve? the signaling is through the vagus nerve, but there are also neurotransmitters involved. And I break all of that down in my book in terms of location and their function and what they do and what happens when they, you know, they're not taken care of in the way that they, they should be, et cetera. So, you know, for example, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are called SSRIs, or sometimes called Prozac in the US or Zoloft. Um, the serotonin receptors, more than 90% of them are found in the gut. So that's also helpful for people to understand that the gut is this very powerful organ now that not only contains, you know, upwards of 39 trillion microbes that live there and that function for us and work with us for our better health. They also help with digestion of food products. They help with, you know, formation of vitamins, hormones, so many other things, but they actually are part of the system that is in our body that helps us function. And it's really part of our role to nurture those gut microbes and the gut microbiome because they're there to help us with our overall health. And when they're not taken care of by, by us eating poorer choice, uh, choices of foods or the less healthy choices, then they, they really can't help us in that way. What type of food should we eat to really just help with good gut health or to help build our, like, I guess our second brain? <laughs> right, to, 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 to help our, uh, you know, help our, our mental health or that very important connection, the food mood connection in nutritional psychiatry. Absolutely. The first and foremost is to fill those, to feed those little bugs down there, the little microbes, um, with fiber, and you get fiber from vegetables, um, fruit, beans, nuts, seeds, um, lentils, uh, and healthy whole grains. You don't get it from animal seafood protein. So the starting point is to make sure that we're eating enough fiber-rich foods that are really feeding those those microbes because that's what they thrive on. Um, another a way to think about this is to add prebiotic fiber to our diet, which we can do. do through a lot of foods that we eat, like the allium family, garlic, leeks, onions, asparagus, oats, bananas, all of those actually bring back another nutrient of prebiotic fiber to those microbes. So that's another easy step for us to be taking care of our gut microbiome. A third is, you know, some people take a probiotic supplement, but other people will eat a form of yogurt, dairy and non-dairy yogurt, or fermented foods like kombucha, kefir, um, uh, miso, natto, tempeh, several others that contain uh, microbes which come back to the gut because you eat those foods. And so, you know, those are good ideas to be some cornerstones of things that you can do to nurture the gut microbes. Another one is, you know, doctors will say, eat the rainbow. And what we're meaning um, as a nutritional psychiatrist, what I mean is eat the colors of the rainbow, those beautiful colors of peppers and, and um, you know, eggplant and uh, different leafy greens um, are all beautiful and really meant to bring back great nutrients, vitamins and minerals to our gut, but they also, have rich polyphenols, which are antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, and they interact. The the um, uh, uh, basically the the nutrients in those colorful veggies interact with those gut microbes, and they interact in a positive way together to create positive breakdown products of food. So they all sort of act in symphony with one another. 
and are really there to help nurture us. And, and the last one I'll mention, there are several more in my book, but the last one I'll mention is leafy greens. You know, people sometimes roll their eyes when I talk about leafy green salads, <laughs> but actually the folate is extremely important uh, for our brain and the nutrients in, in leafy greens are super important for our gut health as well. Wow, that's incredible. And when it comes to our brain health overall, what are some foods we should eat for healthy brain? Absolutely. So we can start with those principles we talked about for the gut because the gut and brain are, connection, are connected. And we know that by eating well for our gut, our brain is connected. And let me explain that a little bit. When, um, when we eat a meal, um, within 24 hours, there are changes in the microbes in our gut. We don't feel it necessarily, but those changes start to happen and research has shown that. So if you're choosing a healthier meal, those microbes are happy, they've been well fed, they're going to function well. But if you've eaten a fast food or kind of a junk food meal, then they also will start to change. But the bad microbes are fed and they start to, to thrive. They start to do well. The bad microbes overcome the good microbes over time. And what eventually happens if you are continuing one of the factors is a poor diet, meaning the not great choices, the less healthy choices over time. Um, if you continue on that path, then the bad microbes set up for what we call dysbiosis or inflammation or a leaky gut. And that becomes, you know, the setting for gut inflammation, basically. And gut inflammation feeds back to brain inflammation. So really, by taking care of our gut, we are taking care of a better mood and lowered anxiety. But additional foods that you can you can add to that are things like spices. You know, spices like saffron um, and uh, turmeric are actually excellent for mood and have been shown in several clinical trials. Um, the B vitamins, uh, zinc and magnesium as, uh, you know, micronutrients and part of the electrolytes we want to be eating and taking in are contained in, you know, certain vegetables, certain fruit, leafy greens, um, all things that we can be eating. And then omega-3 fatty acids is another big one. They are found in fatty fish like salmon or mackerel or sardines, but you can also get plant-based sources in walnuts, chia seeds, flax seeds, and others. So you can, you know, you can start to incorporate these foods to really, really help your mood, your anxiety, your overall mental well-being. And then don't forget about herbs, things like oregano help with mood, things like chamomile and uh, lavender and, and uh, passion flower, which can be added into teas, help with anxiety. So, so there are many different directions that we can, we can go in. Oh, fabulous. And when it comes to fruit, there are so many fad diets out there or yeah. people saying, you know, don't eat fruit, it's high in sugar. But I constantly see the message of blueberries being really good for our brain and obviously things like raspberries being really great, um, bananas. What's your take on fruit and mood? Absolutely. So, you know, in mental well-being, it's really about the type of fruit that you eat and where, what condition you're in um, in terms of both your your. Um, your physical health, but also your mental health. More and more, we're understanding you that, that metabolic health is really important. We know that type 2 diabetes, the COVID pandemic has shown us that when people have pre existing conditions like obesity, type 2 diabetes, um, insulin resistance, cardiovascular disease, things like that, and several others, they are more predisposed to a worse infection and sometimes death. Um, so one of the things that we're also understanding is that what we talked about in terms of inflammation is so important to guard against in terms of our better mental health as well. Studies have shown that inflammation is actually one of the predisposing factors underlying some of those mental health conditions. What does that mean? Now, there are two types of inflammation. There's the normal type of inflammation in our body, which is the kind of um, uh, response that happens when you stub your toe, or you fall and you and you get a get, you know, you, you, you get a scrape on your knee. Then the body has to kick in and heal that 
wound or heal that injury. But beyond that, when it's sort of chronic and ongoing and it's it's just continuing, the inflammation becomes a problem. So what you know what we want to do is really keep our bodies in balance and 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 fend off the inflammation which when it is set up in this situation leads to brain inflammation or neuroinflammation and really men- worsens mental health symptoms. And doctor, when we are looking at, obviously we know we shouldn't be buying uh, obviously processed foods, we should go for the more natural, but I often see people um, who might be on a budget and they're st- right. or on their own, they're standing in front of those pre-made meals Right. If someone is getting something off the shelf, what are a couple of things they should look for in the Absolutely. packaging? Absolutely. And it's it's very hard for any one of us to avoid processed and packaged foods. But I think the more information we have about the choices we make, we can tweak our choices towards our better health. And it's not this, you know, in nutritional psychiatry, certainly the way I practice it, teach it and uh, write about it is not in a judgmental way because it's hard for any of us to make healthy choices. We just all want to do a little bit better. In, in the United States, any movement that we have, again, away from the standard American diet, which is very bad, I think is a win. So I think about it that way. Um, But some tips around how to read a package, okay? One thing is if there's a very big label and they're really words you cannot understand, it probably has a lot of preservatives. If it has a lot of sodium, that's talking about the salt content. And that, you know, really shouldn't be that high but the truth is in packaged and processed foods they add that as a preservative as well as flavoring so that's another thing to watch out for the third is sugar content there are upwards of 200 other names for sugar on food labels a great example is brown rice syrup now people associate brown rice with a healthier grain but brown rice syrup is actually just a form of sugar So just alerting people to what they should look out for so they're not taking in a ton of added sugars and hidden sugars, a ton of sodium or just preservatives, colorants, dyes, stabilizers. If the label is small and it kind of says a couple of ingredients on it, you know, that's something that's a better version than something else. So those are some tips to watch out for. But if you're on a budget, there are also some really budget friendly things that you can eat and buy that are cost effective and good for your brain health. Some examples of that are fresh fruit and veggies are not that expensive, but you can also get them frozen. Just avoid the sauce and the sodium and the syrup that might come with them. But, you know, frozen veggies are perfectly fine to use if, say, the the organic fresh ones are a little bit more pricey. Um, the and and maybe you don't have time to prepare those. Another one uh, is in the center aisles. You get bags of legumes, lentils, which are inexpensive, last a long time, can feed a large family over time, and these can be cooked in a great source of plant-based protein. But you can also get things like canned oysters, canned um, salmon canned sardines, which are great brain foods, canned mussels. All of these are great brain foods. They are rich in zinc, um, uh, salmon, rich in omega-3s. So these are foods which you can start to incorporate that are in the center aisles and can actually help you and not be that, that, that costly. You don't have to go just for a processed food. I know that's the tendency because it's easier, but there are other choices too that maybe we can just start to consider. I love those um, tips. That's incredible. The next question is when it comes to sugar, we're hearing so much about cut sugar out. Why is that? Obviously, how does it affect our brain if we have too much sugar? Obviously, I've seen it affect children um, (laughs) when they have too much sugar. But what about us as adults as well? Sure. So, you know, um, added and refined sugars are the, are the sugar that we are concerned about. You mentioned fruit earlier on. And the difference is that fruit comes with other nutrients, fiber, vitamins and minerals. And so eating, you know, eating berries and mental health become one of the better options because they are lower glycemic fruit. And so if you're struggling a little bit with your weight or you've gained some weight, say, from a medication that you're taking, say, for your mood, then eating berries, strawberries, blueberries are a good option for you because they're low glycemic and you still want to have a few servings 
of a healthy fruit a day. But you know, the problem becomes when uh, when people start to mistake um, store bought orange juice for fruit, right? Because store bought orange juice lacks the fiber. Um, may not have all the nutrients and frankly has a ton of added sugar to it. So I say eat the orange, skip the store-bought oranges because the orange gives you all the nutrients and fiber that you need. In a similar way, unfortunately, added and refined sugars actually worsen anxiety and depression. So this has been shown in research. So we have to be a little bit careful if we're having a ton of foods, candy, candy bars, cookies, cakes, donuts, those types of things that just have added or refined sugars in them. And, you know, they break down very quickly in the body. They worsen anxiety. There's so many things that they do, but they also have been shown to drive those symptoms of depression and worsen symptoms of anxiety. So they are not um, just unhealthy because of the potential for type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance, speaking to our metabolic health, they are also a problem in terms of our mental health now that we've come to understand. And can it, when we're consuming, say, candy bars, donuts and all of these things, can it become quite addictive where we get this in our system and if we have this addictive nature, it's like the next day our body's sort of craving again for this, yes. for this yes. hit? Yeah. or. Uh Absolutely. So it's been shown in research in some animal studies that the way that sugar is broken down in the body um, actually works in the same pathways, reward pathways in the brain, um, the dopamine reward pathways as drugs like cocaine. So there's this reward system that gets set up in our brain. And when we have something like a street drug or we have something like sugar, Unfortunately, it, it activates that reward pathway. So guess what? Our body wants more. It wants to go back for more. It, it keeps it keeps craving it. So, you know, a lot of people um, struggle with that. And it, it really requires some work to, um, to change how we feel around um, sugar and craving it. So that, that is the reason, though. Wow, thank you for sharing that because that makes sense now. But through all of the other incredible tips you've shared with the food, uh, the healthier option that can help break that um, that cycle, that addiction cycle that many of us have found ourselves in over time when yeah. it comes to chocolate yeah. or, you know, you're yeah. using it as a Ice hit cream, to feel candy. good. Yes. That's right. Yeah, I've absolutely. Been there. Yeah. <laughs> but it can and be broken. Is, you know, <laughs> it's, exactly. It's 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 not easy. It, you know, it's 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 everyone has had that at some point or another. And the next question I've got: We go into a pharmacy, we see a gazillion of multivitamins. There's a multivitamins for this, this, this. But before we're choosing a multivitamin, we is there tests and things we should do before going out and spending all this money? when we really sure. don't know what we're deficient sure. in? So, so you know, here's my position on supplements. I do think that certainly in the United States, our diet has, let's say the food we eat is deficient in nutrients and we know that it's not an ideal world. Um, it's not that our food is bad, it's that it's it, it, it has, um, you know, it, it has chemicals. It, it you know, we, we're exposed to different um, things in our environment. We are stressed as a nation. Um, you know, we're not always sleeping that well. So, so many things contribute to our overall health. What I feel about a multivitamin or supplements is a multivitamin has a role. And the reason is, even though for years I've said eat, eat better food, you know, build out your nutrients through food, I still know that as well as people make these great attempts, we might still be deficient. So taking a multivitamin is fine. My guidelines around that, if you are trying to replenish one particular nutrient or micronutrient or mineral or vitamin, check with your doctor. You know, if it's a, if it's a simple multivitamin and they say take one a day, that's okay. But if it's something else, 
have your blood level checked. Make sure that you are replenishing it with the correct type of supplement. Check with your doctor. In the United States, I know that supplements are not FDA regulated. That's why I like people to be a little bit careful. And I don't like them to just supplement without knowledge. So, you know, with, with those types of things, ask your doctor. Multivitamins are fine. And the other supplements that actually help the brain health are things like omega-3 fatty acids. But, you know, and they're also, by the way, vegan sources of that. If you don't eat um, fish, you can actually get one made with algal oil, which is from algae. So, you know, there are options for people if they wish to supplement with those. But just check with your doctor on them. Wow. And the next question I've got, we hear this all the time in social media, cut out dairy, only eat dairy if you're, dairy's uh, for cows, you're not a baby cow, you only meant to have dairy when you're a baby. Like, so it's so <laughs> confusing knowing whether we should have dairy or not. Um, is there something we should just sort of feel in with our mood or maybe our gut when it comes to dairy? Absolutely. So I speak about something in nutritional psychiatry called body intelligence, which is the feeling that people have after they eat something and they ignore. Um, but, you know, if you eat something and you don't feel good or you have brain fog and you need to lay down because it's exhausted, whatever you've eaten makes you tired instead of uplifted or energized or light. Um, you know, I think that that's something to pay attention to. My position on dairy is the following. If it's something that you eat, then just pay attention to good sources of dairy. And um, dairy can certainly, uh, I know about the dairy farming in the United States. I'm not sure um, about the farming in Australia. Um, but I hear, I would say that our regular dairy products are probably very inflammatory. So I say to people, if you do eat dairy, look for um, sources of grass-fed um, dairy. Um, and you can always try goat's milk or sheep's milk yogurt and cheese because they farmed differently. They also have probiotics in them. So you you're still getting a benefit. Go for plain yogurt if you do, because the added um, sh uh, sugar from fruited yogurts are not great. So, you know, go with grass milk if you do eat it. If you can't tolerate it, there are some versions um, of, you know, sheep's milk and goat's milk that you could try if, for example, you're lactose intolerant. If it just doesn't make you feel good, then don't, you know, stay away from it um, and have something else. But I don't I try my best, you bet, not to demonize ingredients because a lot of these things people actually eat every day. So I don't want them to feel bad about a the food they're eating, but I want them to know a little bit more about where they where they could get it or the kind of dairy that's maybe a little bit better for them. But if they don't, they're not doing well with it, then you know that's something they they might need to exclude. And in my book and certain chapters where there's been a, an association with either forms of dairy, then I give guidance around some options for that. Yeah, well, thank you for that because I know it's a huge industry. I personally have switched to Anna Milk and mm -hmm. I just, I intuitively um, just tuned in and I'm doing more of that thanks to your um, words of wisdom and guidance with the intelligence <laughs> of you. working out what I eat, how it makes me right. feel, and then feel. tweaking. So it's a really um, individual, I guess, discovery of what I eat and how it makes me feel. That's so great. I love that I love message. That. Yes, well, that's thanks right. to I, you. I'm excited to hear that. Well, thanks to your <laughs> that's what, book. That's what we should, you know, that's what we should be doing because then we, we're making that association in our minds and we're realizing there's something I should should tweak in, in what I'm doing. And nut milks are great. Some people love them and they, they're great sources of additional protein. Um, hemp milk is actually so easy to make um, you know, you can make it yourself at home. It doesn't require process. And um, it also is a great source of short chain omega-3. So there are lots of lots of other options if someone doesn't like dairy. When it comes to gluten, we have this whole gluten-free section, which I understand um, some people have uh, allergies or uh, medical <laughs> conditions where they really have to go down that path. But gluten on the brain, is this, should we always be going for gluten-free if we are getting something off the shelf? No. Uh, so my, my position on gluten is not that dissimilar from dairy. Let, let's break it down in terms of mental well-being. Certain conditions are worsened, have been shown in correlative studies 
to have worsening symptoms of things like anxiety with gluten. So if an individual comes into me and has severe anxiety and we've tried and tweaked other aspects of their diet, and you know, maybe one of the things we haven't looked at is you know, having them cut back on gluten. We might try that and look for a change in symptoms over a few weeks and see. But I don't generally ask someone to eliminate any any food that they're eating because I understand that it's a challenge to, you know, get good food on our plate, to to pay attention to our nutrition. And I feel that everyone has to start somewhere. So with gluten, it again goes back to the source. You know, if if you if it's a processed packaged um, loaf of bread, the chances are that it is has a ton of added sugar, refined sugars, um, uh, stabilizers, colorants, dyes, and other things to make it last long, right? So if it's very different from if you have a bakery close by and you have, say, sourdough bread, which is actually a, a, a pretty healthy bread. It actually helps the gut bacteria. It has some positive benefits. And if you like that and enjoy it, why not eat it? I think it's, again, much more where, where you get the gluten from and what type of product you're buying. I don't believe it's something has to be gluten-free. That is, uh, uh, the gluten-free industry is a billion-dollar industry in the United States because people associate gluten-free with being healthy or gluten-free with losing weight. And it simply isn't accurate because gluten-free products can have a ton of other starches in them just to replace the gluten from wheat um, and flour products. And so they may not necessarily be healthy. They may have added sugars and other stabilizers dyes just like any other processed food so it's not you know we don't have to just switch to a gluten-free product if you if you have celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity of course you have to look at other options but then i still wouldn't guide you down the aisle with the processed gluten food products if you can avoid it maybe try baking some baking some things at home that are gluten-free or cooking up some things with you know alternate flours or using things like buckwheat or farro um or bar, you know things that that don't necessarily have pure wheat or gluten in them wow you know i'm just sitting here thinking i could spend hours and hours with you asking you so many questions your knowledge on um nutritional psychiatry and food on mood is incredible but i want to ask you now switching to your book because your book is part of the spirit girl book club um Thank and you. i know our audience are now going to want to know like wow how can i learn more about this mm -hmm. but what inspired you to write the book like how did the whole book process start so this is so interesting, Yvette. You know, I was basically developing and, and designing and running my clinic um, in, in nutritional psychiatry, seeing patients, but I also was always invited to write blogs. So I wrote for, I have written for Harvard Health Publications and other, other media outlets. And because of that work, you know, because the media outlet will see something, they'll contact you and say, oh, would you mind writing on this? So um, a media outlet wrote, asked me to write again on the uh, aspect of the gut brain access and I did um, they asked me to write on anxiety and I did but a couple of those then led to an interview in the Wall Street Journal for a weekend edition this was several years ago and um, I thought nothing of it I've been you know contacted by reporters before I gave them the information but that article went into a weekend edition and it was called feed your head and the article went viral unbeknownst to me and I had publishers and agents book agents and publishers reach out to me and um, all of whom said you know you really should write a book on this and and I hadn't thought about it before that so that's really how the book came to be born that you know putting that body of knowledge into a book became um, something that I was encouraged to do and really um, you know no one uh, in the world had put together a compendium of this information looked at the body of research studies correlated the information and then separated it out into the different psychiatric diagnoses, um, but then shared the clinical work that I do. Because I think that, you know, it's one, we all do research, it's great to do research, but you've got to put that together with the clinical side, right? Because knowing statistics and knowing a dietary survey 
or something that um, it, you can read about in a journal article is not the same as sit physically sitting in front of someone and um, working on a dietary nutritional psychiatry plan with them and then seeing how they progress through that. Um, and, and I've had the real privilege as a practicing nutritional psychiatrist doing the clinical work, see people improve. And I think that that was really what I wanted to bring forward in the book, ways to bring hope to people as, you know, there are ways that we can, we can have an additional tool in our toolkit to feel better. Wow, that's such an incredible story. And congratulations on your book and Thank for you. really going to all of the effort to put it together because now you're helping so many people globally with feeling good from within, but with their mental health, with their mood and with their lifestyle. And your book also is becoming viral because you are the one we go to when it comes to food and mood and food and brain health. And also psychiatry has been very much known or we think of um, psychiatry as the medication, right? Like here's right. the drugs, it, you know. Right. Here's some right. medication, here's and the off prescription. you go. Right. And right. normally it's eat well, exercise, and get some sleep. Right. But right. you're really going into what I love about your work is you can work one on one, or now our audience can get your book and become mm-hmm. their own um, food mood expert by really absolutely looking at what they're eating and how it's affecting absolutely. their mood and their health absolutely absolutely so, and as you know uh, thank you for saying that you i i feel very blessed to be in that position so i thank you for that and i i don't take it lightly to um you know that people are, are so interested in the um, in fact I feel blessed because really that's what you want when you write a book. You want to to share the message widely. But at the end of each chapter, you know, there are little uh, little cheat sheets, I call them. And they have a much longer f- list of foods of uh, things to include and a few of foods to kind of stay away from. And then in the recipe chapter, I sort of walk people through how to set up your kitchen, but also very quick lists that you can keep on your phone of foods you should be buying, uh, nutrients, you know, that you want to keep on hand in your kitchen, because it's it's really about trying to put it together for ourselves and trying to do the best that we can. And I think we all need to start somewhere, including myself. So I, I appreciate your feedback. I'm so excited for your book club. That's awesome. Yeah, I love your book. I love your book. And, you know, I'm the biggest fan of your work and I love everything you do because before I discovered you, I just thought of psychiatry or any, you know, depression or anxiety or any mental health um, condition, if it was major, you know, or or minor, needing to be treated Mm -hmm. with medication and maybe some Mm -hmm. yoga Mm -hmm. and... uh, exercise and things Mm -hmm. and we just heard that is important yeah Yeah. and we heard the statement of eat well but it wasn't until I discovered your work where it was like oh if you're eating sugar you know it could increase your anxiety like if you're eating a lot of it too very high in sugar and Mm -hmm. just the knowledge of okay if I you know bring out you know cut down on the sugar and go to more plant-based or more healthy mm-hmm. food that that can really help your mood so i just feel it's so empowering it's empowering Absolutely. for people to have like i guess yes they might need medication but also their whole life can just completely transform just by the food they're eating and i feel yes. that's liberating yes. really liberating to anyone and and empowering, very empowering, yeah. and and very liberating because it's it's a very powerful thing to write a prescription. And I really have learned that while I have that uh, medical knowledge and the ability to do it, it's 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 also they're they're really needed. Uh, you've had to be more tools in our toolkit for people to feel better. Writing or taking a medication or writing that prescription doesn't exclude the use of food. Any one of us right now can make a healthy choice in terms of what we're eating, what we're doing, um, to feel emotionally better. And if your doctor would like you to take a medication, you can still eat healthy as you do that. Um, and that's what I would encourage. Also, really, you know, when I spoke about my 
my Hindu roots earlier, you know, I, I really believe in a mind body approach. So all of those things that you mentioned are important, but I think that you're absolutely right. We're often, to be honest, doctors are not taught nutrition. Most of our medical schools in the US, we, we're not learning enough nutrition. Some are doing better than others. But that was why I went out and actually studied it was because I felt that that was a gap and I knew um, that it meant something. I knew from my childhood it meant something. I knew I felt better when I ate better. I may not have known there was science behind it. I, you know, as I when I was younger, but I discovered that through my research. And I think it is very empowering when you know that the power of how you feel is at the end of your fork. And why not, you know, why not make a better choice? Um, because it'll lead to feeling better overall. Yeah, why not? I love how you said the power is at the end of your fork that's so true and sometimes we feel like uh we don't have the power but you just said yeah. the words that resonates to myself and and i'm sure all of our podcast listeners tuning in the power is at the end of your fork so if we can try our best to make the healthy choices that can help us make you know feel good from within so we have the power and it's at the end of our fork. I love that. That is so incredible. And I love, love, love your work, as you know. And I really feel that every uh, doctor who's got people coming in about mental health conditions or psychologists or psychiatrists or people in the medical profession, I know your book's becoming a go-to reference where they can read it and learn and then that can help them also with their patients. And I really feel okay. seeing that movement happening um, is really empowering, especially with so many regional and remote um, communities in Australia. Right. We have a lot of remote right. Aboriginal communities. Um, right. Right. And just getting your access and your knowledge and your book um, can really help someone also in their day-to-day life and their day-to-day -day health okay. medical role as well. So Dr. Uma Naidu, I want to ask you, what's your favorite go-to recipe that you love to cook? One of my favorites, yes, one of my favorites, I have two. Uh, so one of them is um, the spinach dal recipe that I talk about and, and shared in my book because it's just a nutritious, uh, delicious recipe. It has the Indian spices that I love. It has lentils, great source of plant-based protein and fiber. It has the leafy greens from from um, from and folate from uh, the spinach, and it's something that was is just a very soothing dish to me. And I add it to, and I have it with other. Uh, things that I eat as well. Um, and, you know, I also love uh, being creative with spices around things like, say, cauliflower. I make a cauliflower steak, but I'll use, um, you know, a, a, a homemade tandoori spice mix on that. So instead of making chicken tandoori, I'll do it. I love changing things up like that and challenging myself. So those are some of the, the, the ones I like to experiment with. And I always love um, you know, a good kind of uh, spicy curry if, if, if there's time to make one. Um, but I also, you know, kind of, I kind of love all food. I got to say, just, I just, you know, I'm, I, I love food and I, and I'm, I'm, I'm so privileged to be able to do my work in the area that I love. So. Yeah. Well, cause you're also a trained, a professional chef. I am a chef. I'm a chef. Incredible. Yes. So your your background is so unique when it comes to nutritional psychiatry and food. You've got the chef background. You've got the upbringing, um, thanks to your beautiful grandmother and your heritage. And then you've got the research, the science, the practical online, you know, life skills. And it just all just... Um, gels into one. Now I want to ask you what you are always giving. You give so much. You are such a, a woman on a mission to help so many people feel good from within. You just like, you just want to help so many people just, you know, reduce anxiety, <laughs> depression, help with the post-traumatic stress disorder, OCD, um, ADH, like all of these, um, you know, yeah, mental all these health. Conditions. Yeah. And obviously yeah. In, in the height of the pandemic, 
this um, anxiety has gone through the roof um, and even depression when people are sadly can't see their loved ones or yes. um, and there's so much going on but you give so much. Now, how do you take care of yourself and what are some of your self-care rituals? So, you know, um, I really, it's how I, it, the most important thing that I learned was self-care. Self-care is not selfish. And I learned uh, early on in my life to really set up my day by how I woke up and what I did when I opened my eyes. And so I learned to um, have my phone, you know, not right next to me and have it, you know, sound turned off so I wasn't distracted because you know what it's like you've had people are texting you from different parts of the world and you're kind of getting dis your sleep disrupted and the first thing I do when I open my eyes is I try to when I can I love to watch the sunrise um, and days when I uh, feel you know some days I will get up and do a sun salutation yoga other days I will read, I'll switch that out with reading a, a gratitude card or an affirmation card. Just I pick out of a little stack that I have and I just sort of look at whatever it tells me and I accept whatever it is and I always feel I learn something. But I, I spend a few minutes doing this. It doesn't take me long. Um, when there's time, I meditate in the morning. I try to get in at least 10 to 20 minutes. And if I can't, I'll do five minutes. If it's a busy day, I'll at least do five minutes. So I do those few things just to really center myself in my day and kind of ground myself a little bit. Um, because once the day hits, once the phone is turned on, once the emails are opened, um, you know, the day just rolls in. And uh, it's been so busy that I've really had to hold on to that for myself. And I always have a good cup of coffee in the morning. I look forward to that. And I usually do that. And then I start checking the emails and the messages and stuff like that. But I, uh, a few minutes before that, I, I spend on my own. Oh, that is such a beautiful wake up self care ritual that you have. That is yeah. so amazing. And Dr. Uma Nadu, Thank you so much for being part of the Spirit Girl podcast show today and the book club, Spirit Girl Book Club Globally, and Thank sharing you. your book and sharing your words of wisdom, your story, and so many um, practical tips that we can really use in our day-to-day -day life. You've empowered you. us so much Thank today you. with your knowledge, your expertise, your research, the science behind it. And I just know that you're going to help thousands and thousands of people today who are tuning in um, to you. our podcast so. globally. And I just, I'm getting goosebumps why I say this, but <laughs> I'm so honoured and grateful that you spent oh, so you. much time with Thanks. us today but also for all of the work you do and while I say this I can't help think that I want to pay gratitude to your grandmother too who you wanted oh, your book you. to thank and you. who also Absolutely. started um inspired you on this food mood um fun you know exploring curiosity journey so thank you for all that you are you. and all that you do I appreciate that so much, Yvette. I would love for all of you to stay in touch with me. I was so excited to hear from you that people are reading or even have the book in Australia. It's really touched to hear that. And um, I would say that, you know, ways to keep in touch with me on social media. We're always posting information, updated research. Um, and you can find me at D-R-U-M-A. N-A-I-D-O-O, -O, that's at Dr. Uma Naidu. You can subscribe to my website where you'll get a news, uh, weekly newsletter from us and you'll also hear about stuff that I'm up to and that's umanaidumd.com and uh, please follow us on Instagram and other, other social media sites so you can keep in touch. We always love hearing from people all over the world. Wow, lovely. Thank you so much. So Dr. Uma Nadu will say officially goodbye and so much gratitude you. to you. And to our Spirit Girl, thank um, thank you again, Dr. Uma Nadu. Thank you for being part okay. of the Spirit Girl show. We will officially say goodbye. Thank you to everyone who's tuning in globally. I really hope that this podcast show has served you well, that you've learned something brand new today. 
that there is something that Dr. Uma Nadu has said that has really resonated with you and you're going to give it a go, a try. But I totally recommend grabbing a copy of her book. Uh, I will leave the link. So we've got the Food Mood Connection. Um, but I'll make sure I leave the link to Booktopia as well as Dr. Uma Nadu's details. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm super grateful that you tune in every week and be sure to subscribe, leave a five-star rating and review and to tell someone you love too. And together, let's feel good from within. Bye for now.